I feel like I'm in a some sort of pageant. <laughs> this is great. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Megan Stas with the Grocery Manufacturers Association. I'm really excited to um, to be here today and to be here with this panel. If you thought the session before this was a little bit nerdy, well, you're about to get really nerdy. We have. Um, a phenomenal group of experts, I mean real experts, on the, the details of what's happening on the ground um, in the issues of packaging and recycling throughout the entire supply chain um, as, we, as we see it on the ground. So I think um, this is going to be a phenomenal um, panel. We have a really great group here for you. Um, what I would really encourage you guys to do is to participate and ask questions as we go. Um, we can certainly, you know, stop and hold some time for Q&A at the end, but I think these always go better uh, when you get engaged and, and ask us questions during the session. Um, I know I had to hold uh, Keith back and David back a couple of times during the, the um, general session panel, and I know there were a lot of you guys who probably were, you know, had thoughts and were, had questions sort of bursting out um, during the, the first one before this, so... Um, we really want to you know, let, those, let those questions fly as, um, as you have them. So we do have the, the great team from Waste Management is running mics. If you have questions, you can either hold up your card or hold up your hand and we'll, and we'll, get, them, we'll get them in. Um, so what I thought I'd do is let, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, sort of what each group here, what each person who's in their company or their organization um, is doing specifically, give you a sense of sort of how they're looking at recycling circular economy um, and some of these challenges. Um, and then also we're going to take a little bit of time to respond to some of the, um, the opinions and the, the conversation that, um, that happened on the panel earlier today. And then we'll talk about some of the challenges um, and opportunities and real successes um, and sort of where we go from here around this concept of circular economy and, and what does it mean. Um, so I want to start with, um, with David Alloway from Oregon, um, Department of Environmental Quality. Um, you know, the, David, I'd, I'd really like to hear from you and sort of talk to this audience a little bit about, um, you know, Oregon uses a phrase um, of a, con a concept called materials management, uh, which is a, another term that gets, that's kick gets kicked around a lot. So what does that mean to you? What does that mean to the state? Um, what does that mean to an audience like this? Right. Well, thanks. Uh, so materials management is not the parent company of waste management. <laughs> um, and it's a term that's sort of confusing because it means different things to different people. In a lot of other states, they've adopted this phrase materials management basically as a way of rebranding the old hierarchy of reduce, reuse, recycle. It's kind of an old wine and new bottles phenomenon. In Oregon, with our uh, 2050 vision for materials management. We're using a def the definition the same way that the US EPA does. Basically, materials management, wait for it here, materials management is taking actions across the entire life cycle of materials in order to reduce environmental impacts across the entire life cycle of materials. So it includes the traditional efforts of many people in this room to prevent and manage discarded materials. But it's much broader than that. It goes upstream into design, production and consumption. And why do we do this? We do this because at the end of the day, DEQ is not a solid waste agency. We're an environmental agency. Our goal is to protect the environment. Materials management and the broader view that it offers gives us a bigger toolbox with more effective tools so that we can use our limited resources to achieve greater environmental benefits in a more effective way and to make better decisions. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean for recycling and product design more broadly, from your perspective as a, a government agency, as a state agency? Right. It, it, it means a lot of things. I mean, first of all, as, as we heard from Jim earlier this morning, it's really about asking the question, what is our goal? What is it we want to accomplish? For us, it's about environmental outcomes. So recycling is, is clearly situated as a means to achieve those environmental outcomes when it makes sense to do so. Mm -hmm. So. In Oregon, we recently proposed and our legislature adopted statewide recovery goals for food waste and plastics. Why food waste and plastics? Because we looked at what's in our waste stream and we said, okay, if we could recycle, increase recycling or composting these various materials, what would give us the most bang for the buck? And when we evaluated for energy savings and greenhouse gas reductions, food waste and plastics are important. So for us, we're targeting these, mat these materials. It's not recycling for the sake of recycling. It's recycling to achieve an environmental outcome. It also means that we're changing the way in which we count, in which we set our goals and measure progress. Oregon, like almost every other state and the nation, has a recovery rate. It's weight-based. 
It's the percentage of materials discarded that get recycled. And in this weight-based approach, all recycling is the same. Composting a ton of leaves counts just as much as recycling a ton of aluminum, even though the environmental benefits are vastly different. So we've proposed and will implement in 2018 a new approach that will recalculate recovery goals based on the actual environmental outcomes, such as energy savings and greenhouse gas emissions reduction. The purpose of this is to inform the local stakeholders in our state and elsewhere about what really makes a difference so that they can prioritize their efforts to achieve these shared objectives. Materials management also means um, that we're going to put a lot more emphasis on waste prevention, the reduce, reuse part. And I want to talk about food for just a moment. We, we heard from Adam earlier about methane emissions from landfills. And it's true. I mean, food on average in an average landfill is going to produce more methane than the landfill captures, et cetera. It's a bad thing from a climate perspective. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. When we look at wasted food, and the National Institutes of Health estimate that 40% of all the food produced in this country never gets eaten, the greenhouse gas impacts of producing that food in the first place are easily 10 times higher than the emissions from the landfill. Anaerobic digestion, composting, and even edible food rescue and salvage don't do anything to reduce those upstream impacts. So to be effective, we really need to go upstream into true prevention. And as we roll out new programs in the next 12 months on food, we're going to be putting more resource and more emphasis on the prevention side than we are on the recovery side. We're going to try to increase recovery as well, but it's not going to be our top focus. Mm -hmm. And finally, materials management means that we're going to be doing some new work um, upstream in, in production and design. And it's not always designed for recyclability. I think we're going to get into this a little bit later about how um, sometimes the recyclable material isn't necessarily the best environmental choice. So for us, it's about designing materials to reduce their environmental impacts viewed holistically across the entire life cycle. That's, that's great. I think there's a lot, of, there's a lot there that I, that I absolutely want to get back to, especially around this, this new idea about measuring for environmental uh, outcomes and this idea of prevention and source reduction, I know, is, is big to all of us. And, and what's the metric that we should all be using? But um, to, get on, to, to drill down into recycling a little bit, Keith, you lead the recycle, a group called the Recycling Partnership, which has been around since 2003. Uh, but you recently changed your name from one thing to the Recycling Partnership. Why did you do that? What is the Recycling pro Partnership? And do you think that this name chain re re reflects uh, an overall trend in the industry? Or can you sort of talk about your decisions to, to do that and rebrand yourself a little bit? Sure. Um, so David just talked about recycling as it fits into the bigger picture. And I think today as we discuss circular economy, recycling is just one part of that. Um, but we, uh, I've been working in recycling since 1998 and had been working with a group of uh, packaging producers and recycling, so both, both public and private sector members, trying to figure out if we just narrow in on the recycling picture, how can we build a better system? How, how do we make more out of what's there right now? Uh, and so I came into my role as the executive director of then Curbside Value Partnership. Uh, almost two years ago with an intense focus on looking at how does the recycling system work, what are the barriers for making the most of that system, and can we design public-private solutions to address those barriers. So the recycling industry, we're talking about that today, and I, I thought Adam was spot on when he talked about how, you know, when someone puts a bottle in a bin, they're recycling, and when the city picks it up, they're recycling, and the Murph stores that they're recycling, one word, many, many different things. At each stage of the game, not only is there a different action, but there's a different driver, and there's a different economic model that supports that. So we at the Recycling Partnership look at that whole system, identify solutions to overcome those barriers, and then we zero in on what happens between the community and MRF to build our solutions there. And, and why, do we, why do we focus on that? Well, that's the beginning of our reverse supply chain, right? Why does recycling exist? We, is it to save landfills? That was debated earlier. No, recycling exists to build materials for manufacturing. It's the supply chain for manufacturing. And until you put on that lens, you're not able to accurately assess what is the industry, what is the system, and how well is it working. So we serve the supply chain, but then we build solutions uh, that fit most in there. And we really start by saying, why does the community recycle? Do they care about the end markets? Not as much. They want to provide a good city service and do that as efficiently as possible. So we meet them there 
while at the same time going for what the MRF needs of more cleaner, better material. And I, I think talking about contamination and quality today will be very important. That's great. I think the, the contamination issue, the process issue, right, how do we get consumers engaged, how do we get all the bright actors engaged all along the chain is going to be really, really critical to success, right? And I love this, you know, that, that visual of it's one piece in this loop, right, but it's a critical piece. So, um, so I definitely want to talk about that more. Jim, you're here from Starbucks, a brand everybody knows. You have a cup everybody knows. <laughs> You have a waste challenge that a lot of us, especially you know, those of us who work in this industry and work in this room, really know about. And um, you know, Starbucks, as I know, it has taken a systems-based, what you call a systems-based approach um, to waste management. And you've set some really ambitious goals for yourselves, including sure. um, around the recyclability of your cup and having consumer-facing uh, consumer recycling in all of your stores, which um, you know, anything involving that consumer interaction is, is really challenging and, and redesigning that cup and the materials that go into that cup are really, really challenging. How's that going? How are your, how are you doing? Is it, is it, are you making progress? What are some of your challenges? Can you sort of talk about this experience with Starbucks? Well, it's going well, but I think, um, you know, first after Pete's talk, we all need a latte or a frappuccino to pick us <laughs> up. So let's head out there after, after this session's over. That was, that was tough, but, um, and it's, it's interesting, it's hard to talk about coffee and cups after, after conversations like that, but we're going to, um, I think one of the commitments we all made at this panel is to try to bring it back down to, from the 30,000 foot level down to uh, on the ground. So we'll talk a bit about on the ground. And um, Megan's right, as, as a company, we put some, some pretty uh, ambitious stakes in the ground in, in 2007, 2008 to be able to first declare our cups recyclable by 2015. And as you all know, that recyclability, that, that the definition of recyclability varies, but for us it was that the products are actually getting recycled. And then the second one was real, to be able to provide uh, front of house collection or customer facing collection in, in all of our company owned stores by 2015. And we're just about to release our, our, our last year set of numbers. And happy to report, we are well north of 50% uh, of stores now have customer facing recycling in, in North America. And you know, the, the cynic would say, well, dude, you totally missed your 100% targets. And I would say the realist in, in the room, and I, I assume you are a realist in the room because we're all so involved in the industry, would say, nice damn job, Starbucks. And, you know, I hope that you say that as well because, you know, as Megan alluded to, we put out this global target around providing recycling for our customers. Frankly, the reason we did that was we were hearing demand from our customers that they wanted to be able to have something to do with the products and the packaging that we generate uh, at end of life. So it's that guilt factor that we all talked about earlier. Um, and then we also heard from our partners. So our, we call our employees partners um, for obvious reasons. They all have ownership in the company. But the average demographic of the Starbucks uh, barista is about 24 years old, and they demand this from us. And they, they say, if I'm going to work for you and if I'm going to work for a company that aligns with my values, recycling is top of the agenda for us. So it's, it's a bit of an irony because if you, look at, if you look at the environmental footprint of our cups compared to everything else we do at Starbucks, you know, this huge supply chain of coffee, this huge supply chain of other materials, these roasting plants all over the world, they're roasting 500 million pounds of coffee per year, uh, the 20,000 stores we operate around the world, that's where the real environmental footprint is at Starbucks. And, and frankly, things like cups are lost in the rounding when we look at the total footprint of, of, our, of our company. But we know that as a brand that must remain relevant to the general public and must remain relevant to our customers, this is a top priority for them. So we focus on it and we choose to focus on it and we choose to put out these ambitious targets around providing that recycling service for our customers. So I think we're doing really well, but one of the things we discovered early on, which again, eight years ago felt kind of new and today everyone just says, well, duh, is that recycling is a hyper-local issue. And for a global company with stores in pretty much every community around North America and more and more around the world, our, our ability to have global targets and execute them at a hyper-local level is a challenge. And we know that the market conditions are different in every community. We know that the regulations are different in every community. We know that the access to services is different in every community. We know that a relationship with our landlords, which is one of the primary drivers of our lack of success in recycling, is different in every building, in every store. And so when we continue to push that 100% target and reach 50, 60% of that target, um, we're on a good trajectory. And what I also hope is that we're, we're creating a playbook for the rest of the industry. Because if there's one thing that I'm really proud of at Starbucks that we do is we don't just say how can we change the way we do things, we say how can we change the way things are done. And our goal all along with this recycling target was to say not just 
how can we execute recycling in Starbucks? How can we make our cups recyclable? It was really how can we blaze a pathway for all retailers out there, for everyone who's producing single service or, or food service packaging to be able to recycle that product at its end of life. Um, and that's been our focus all along is how do we not just do this to Star Starbucks, but how do we scale it up? And I think in addition to the numbers we've been able to produce in our own stores, that's been the real success story is seeing the industry take this on as a challenge. Um, my friend Lynn Dyer, I see her over there from the Food Service Packaging Institute. You know, they chose as an organization to take this on as a challenge, this notion of how do we get more and more food service packaging into the recycling stream. And that's what we need to solve these issues is scale, 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 and not just one company focusing on it. So um, it's going well, and I'm sure we'll have more to talk about it later, but um, you know, we continuously need to focus on how we can take things from the, the level of one company and frankly be willing as individual brand owners out there, as individual organizations out there to say, I'm going to help solve this for us and then I'm going to hand it off to you so you can work, execute it. And to be willing to also let others to say, it's okay to let someone else lead on this, even if they're a hyper competitor of ours. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then take their lead and, and execute those internally because we've got to focus on scale. Yeah. I and I think this, this idea of creating pull in the industry is really fascinating too, right? Because I think you've demonstrated that it's, this is not a problem that one industry or one company or one sector can solve on their own, right? I mean, this is a systems challenge, right, in terms of how to get these materials back. So along those lines, um, Jeff, with you know, Dow has been a real, you know, you're a, a supplier of so many things to, to major brands. Um, your your, your R&D team is coming up with new and innovative things all the time. Um, but I know you're also a leader on a lot of these industry collaboration efforts to um, recover some of the new kinds of plastics or more difficult to recycle plastics that are, that are, um, that are going on out there. Uh, what, can you talk about some of the leadership and some of the projects that you guys are leading on with for the industry and, and talk about some of the work that you guys have done there? Sure. We have a lot of different initiatives that we're leading. I think before I talk about that, though, I just want to step back just one step and ask the question, why are we all here? Why do we need a sustainability forum? Why are we talking about sustainability? Why is circular economy important as a topic? Why is recycling important? Right? I'm trained as a scientist, and as a scientist, first you define the problem and then you give the solution. Sometimes in recycling, we try to give the solution before we've really decided what the problem is. So in our case, we've defined the problem as we need a more sustainable society. We're using resources at 1.5 times the rate that the Earth is able to provide them to us on a global basis, and we've got to quit doing that, or we are going to run out. It might not be for 75 or 100 years, as John uh, said this morning. It might be sooner than that. I don't know exactly when we're going to run out. I don't think the predictions that people give of when our resources might run out are very accurate. And I think some of the people that talk about those things are really fear-mongering. So, you know, I believe in our ability to innovate and solve problems. So I'm, I'm not going to stand up here and say the sky is falling because I don't believe it is falling. But I think it is important for us collectively as an industry to address the issue of sustainability and work to find meaningful solutions that are practical, that we can implement on the ground, that work for all the parties that are sort of based on the kinds of premises that David talked about of using science to see what the impact is. So if we look at the problem as one of overall sustainability, then we need to think about the big picture of how do we improve that. And we do it with tools like recycling to reduce our resource depletion rate, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce our energy usage. So we have lots of different projects at Dow that we're implementing and that I'm doing through the various industry association groups that I work with. Uh, the Sustainable Packaging Coalition has a label program, for example, to educate people, consumers. What do they do with the package? Do they put it in the recycle bin? Do they take it back to the grocery store and put it in with their shopping bags at the grocery store? How many in the audience knew that you could take your shopping bags to the grocery store and along with those shopping bags you can deposit items like the overwrap from a case of soft drinks or the overwrap from a package of paper towels. I just want to see by a show of hands how many knew that you could put all of those items in there. So quite a few of you did know that, but there are a lot of hands that didn't go up, right? So there's an opportunity to educate consumers. Uh, a year ago or so, we did a project in California called our Energy Bag Project, and you can find more information at energybag.com. We have a little website with a video you can watch. We collected what would otherwise be non-recyclable plastic packaging, things like those flexible pouches for baby food that we heard about this morning, right? We take those, we sent them to a plant that did a chemical conversion process on them and made them into feedstock for a refinery that could be made into fuel uh, or into new plastics. 
right? So it's a different way to recycle. It's a different way to think about our resources. But those kinds of projects are really intended to help people expand their options so that they have more choices in different ways to take advantage of what used to be waste, but now it's a resource. So we're taking waste out of the system and we're putting resources back into the system. The circular economy is really about closing the loop for the resources by keeping the resources in use for as long as we can and as best we can. Uh, if we really want to have a sustainable society, we're going to have to do a better job managing our resources. That's why we need sustainable materials management. It's why we need energy policy. It's why we need all kinds of other tools to help us. Um, but in the world of recycling and packaging, really thinking about waste as a resource, I think, is a first key enabler uh, that gets us there. And we've really designed some of our programs uh, around that effort. So let's take a step back and sort of go back up before we get really into the, the brass tacks of what we all do every day and what is happening on the ground and, and take a little bit of time to, to, to respond to some of the themes, I think, that came out of this overall sort of recycling argument that, uh, or debate that, that we had earlier this morning. Um, you know, I heard a few themes or sort of questions come out from that, right? You know, what's the role of government in recycling or in the circular economy or in sustainable materials management? Um, do, does recycling, you know, create jobs? What's the economic benefit to, to recycling? Um, does design for recycling work? Is it a good idea? You know, what's this, what, you know, what's the idea of the role of consumer and pay as you throw and some of these other sort of, um, um, consumer engagement, you know, sort of point of sale ideas. Um, I'd like to give sort of each of you the opportunity to talk about, because I know there were some things that for each of you are, you know, are real points of, of interest and areas of expertise for you. Um, to give you the opportunity to, to respond to some of the, the opinions and, and thoughts that were expressed earlier today. Want to start with Keith? Sure. Um, so, so the question really being about looking at the, the local government perspective, the state government perspective of starting this. Okay, so the thing to understand about local government and why they're involved with recycling is that it is never, ever a profit center for them. Even if they get some revenue sharing back from MRFs when markets are good, which Peter says we should hold on to, yeah. wait for. So even when, there, it never offsets the cost of what it takes to collect and haul that material to a MRF. However, there are significant savings that can be made uh, in, in avoiding disposal. So why do they engage? The MRF has to make the hauler has to make money, the MRF has to make money, the converter, the mill, the end user, the, everyone else has to make money off of this process, except for the local government. So why are they here? They're here because it is a service that their citizens want. It's an indicator of community health, it's an indicator of how they're connected to their industry or to their neighbors, and it's not a motivator for them very often, but they are a driver for providing material to manufacturing. So it's essential for it to be there. So sometimes I hear like, why do we, why do we need a nonprofit for recycling? It's a market driven activity. What, what, why are you growing so much? We've, we've more than tripled in our budget in the past two years. Why? Well, because we need to find better solutions to improve their efficiency. So um, when we can see that communities like Scarborough, Maine, have over a million dollar savings in landfills by expanding their recycling program, then we see it work. When we see cities like Orange, well, Orange County, County, North Carolina, switch to curbside cart collection instead of bin, they save 200 grand. Um, and that's not even counting uh, their uh, savings in um, workers' comp by making a more efficient system. So we exist to use the infrastructure that's there to make their jobs of starting this material supply chain work better and to find efficiencies. It's really about the penny saved that goes into um, building a healthier one. Uh, and I think it's crucial. Uh, we're a rapidly changing industry. We are evolving. And the best management practices to keep up with this evolving industry change with it. And without an advocate to help connect the local government drivers to the MRF and the industry needs, uh, we, we're, we're a gap. Um, remember, recycling is a loosely connected Highly dependent network. It's not a thing. What do you think, Peter? I'm sorry. What do you think, David? Well, you know, thinking about some of the themes that were raised this morning, um, 
I want to come back to John Charity's hate mail for a moment. Um, <laughs> we had a number of, of cities who came to us after John after the New York Times published his most recent piece saying, oh, wow, my city councilor just read this thing in the New York Times, and she's ready to pull the plug on our curbside recycling program. John, you are that powerful. Yeah. Um, you know, and so we were asked to provide a response. We did produce one, and um, Alex, if you're, if you're listening, if you could pull the response slide up for just a moment so people can get the uh, URL off of this document we produced. Um, John, this is not a piece of hate mail. In fact, a, a third of what we wrote in here, much to the surprise of our other progressive colleagues in the recycling community, we, we agree with some of the principles you, you raised. Um, <coughs> programs as you increase, you know, as you go after more and more materials, marginal costs go up, marginal benefits go down. The whole zero waste thing is, is, is highly problematic in our view. Um, but although this is not a love letter, um, it, it's also not a piece of hate mail. Um, a, a couple of points I would like to make in response to it is that, you know, John said that the greenhouse gas benefits of plastic and food recovery are two-tenths of one percent of the nation's carbon footprint. That's not small folks. And plastics and food are very immature young programs, really, compared to paper and, and metals. I mean, all of us collectively here represent well less than two-tenths of one percent of the electorate in the upcoming general election. Should we just not vote, you know, all of us, because we're just less than two-tenths of one percent? Recycling in this nation reduced our greenhouse gas emissions by three percent from all, you know, across the entire nation's carbon footprint. For the state of Oregon, we reduced greenhouse gas emissions by four and a half percent of all emissions from all sources through recycling. Flying on airplanes, the greenhouse gas savings from recycling in Oregon in 2010 were about the same as all of the emissions from all Oregonians flying everywhere in the world in that same year, not just going from New York to London. So there's some very significant environmental benefits here. Um, what's the role of government? One of the roles of government um, is to protect the public interest and to protect against failures of the market. Um, the market sometimes makes suboptimal decisions um, in its magical, invisible handish sort of way because prices do not reflect the cost to society. Global warming, toxic pollutants present real, measurable costs to society. And when these costs are not reflected in the prices that we as consumers pay for products or the prices that we as generators of garbage pay for waste, then we make decisions that are not optimal. And so I think there's a very... Um, defensible role for government, and there's a bunch of different ways. We can debate the mechanism, but, but one of the, um, the, the justifiable roles for government is to protect the public interest and attempt to correct some of these failures in the market. Mm -hmm. Can I pick up a bit on what David's saying? Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting listening to all these conversations this morning, even up here on our panel. I mean, um, everyone's right, you know, yeah. and but everyone is coming at it from their own set of success metrics. And this has been, I would say, one of the biggest challenges to the recycling industry specifically is, is we all are measuring our success based on different factors. And you see this collision of values, of economics, of environments, and all these different things, and we're just not getting good alignment. And you know, I appreciate you saying that we focus on the system because um, I think that's what we all need to be focusing on in a much better way, in a stronger way, is the system itself. I mean, you know, John focused specifically on the, in the um, economic conversations. You know, Keith, you've been talking about the environmental benefits. David, you know, I, I fully appreciate what Oregon's doing in switching your metric to focus on climate um, because I think that's one of the coalescing metrics we can all focus on. But, but we see over and over again, you know, we deal with this every day, whether it be our, our corporate clients, our university clients, or our cities where we operate in, um, everyone's got a different set of metrics. And right now, you know, I think the, the focus on both zero waste, 100% diversion, all these different things is presenting a big challenge. A, because those are, you know, those are, those are mountains. What did, uh, what did people say around sustainability? It's a mountain you'll never climb. You know, those are mountains that we achieve to, but we may never reach the summit. And it's, it's good to have stretch goals. I know it. Um, but at the same time, we need to focus on the metrics that we all can align around and, all, and that all matter. And we've all, I think, agreed on just a diversion metric while not meaningless, is not necessarily a, a measure of environmental performance. And if we could get everyone actually saying that and agreeing to that, I think that would be huge progress in itself, in that diversion should not be the way we're measuring success in recycling programs. 
you know, Keith talks about, about materials management and getting things back in the supply chain. That's also a metric we ought to be using. But we've got to coalesce around at least one or two metrics that we all can agree on. And David, I totally agree. I think that metric ought to be climate. You know, and it ought to be carbon emissions because that's something we can apply some commonalities to. And that's also a lens we can create when we either put our own programs in place or put our own targets in place or frankly challenge those who we do business with when we talk about their targets. And there's not enough challenging happening in the industry right now. Um, Jim gave a fantastic conversation around the challenges the recycling industry faces today. We need to have, more, have that conversation in more of a public way and not just between internal conversations around the, you know, around between customer and, and provider of services. That type of conversation needs to get out into the public because what we really need is a shift in mind share. When we talk about technology, we talk about all these different things, but we need a shift in mind share for people to say, all right, this decision I make, let's put a lens on it that we all agree upon so we can focus on improving that lens. It's not just diversion, it's not just landfill free, but what is the actual environmental benefit of these, of these conversations? If we can align around that, mm -hmm. then I think we can all start to focus on some common solutions. Yeah. If, I can give an, if I can give an example of, of hello, are we on? You're yes, on, yeah. yeah. You can give an example, <laughs> an example absolutely. Right? I mean, we heard about flexible packaging. Um, I'd like to bring up another slide if we can. Alex, the coffee slide, please. Um, there, there are many different studies that, that, I, that I could share on this point, um, but here's just, uh, one of them coming up hopefully soon. If we agree that the reason we recycle is because we want to reduce, we want to conserve resources such as energy and reduce pollution, take a look at this. This is from an EPA study. There are many other studies like this. And I'm sorry, this is not Starbucks coffee. This is, okay. this is, um, <laughs> Actually, it's probably good this, is, this, is, this is instant coffee, okay? Coffee. Look, there's a couple different ways in which you could package instant coffee. It could be in a steel can, which is eminently recyclable. It could be in a plastic tub, which is recyclable in many communities, or it could be in one of these newfangled flexible pouches. Look here at the energy consumption and the greenhouse gas emissions, and even the municipal solid waste generation over the life cycle of these materials. The flexible pouch is the hands-down winner. And even if you could recycle that steel can or the plastic container with like an 80% capture rate, which is almost unheard of in this country, you're still not going to get the total environmental impact down to where it's lower than the flexible pouch. So if the goal is to conserve energy and reduce pollution, then we need to make decisions that conserve energy and reduce pollution and focus on what are we trying to achieve as opposed to chasing some dogma around total landfill diversion or zero waste or, or something like that. So I always you know, just encourage people to keep the goal in mind and make sure that we're focusing on that goal. So I totally agree with what you said there. But who, who is having that conversation with their customers? That's the biggest challenge. I mean, we, we have these conversations internally. We all you know, agree upon that. But when it finally comes to challenging your customers directly, um, I think we all clam up. You know? and, and what we often see is that we see, not to pick on any waste management companies, but we often see waste management companies say, all right, I got an opportunity for a 20-year contract here. But as part of that, I got I to gotta agree to take in all these materials that I know are going to be significantly difficult to manage in the current operations. And frankly, may not have a, better, may not have a good environmental story behind them as well. But this is, this is the parameters that my customer put upon me and for, in order for me to get this business, I have to just agree to it. Um, so those conversations need to be happening during the formative stages, relation, or the formative pieces of these relationships between customer and vendor, whatever that looks like, you know, whether that's between a coffee company and university, or that's between a waste hauler and a municipality, wherever it happens to be, so that we can all agree upon the right metrics to measure ourselves by, and we can all agree what success looks like. We're not there yet. Well, I think that's what we're doing, but on a, you know, if, if you're having a hard time having that conversation with your customer, it's also having a hard time having that conversation with your company and your company sure. and every other sure. company. So the, the, the factor of measurement is huge for us. When we, for instance, when you look at the national recycling rate, what do you see? Flat. See a plateau. So does that mean that the consumer apathy has set in and that we're not seeing behavior change? No. It means that that ton of recyclables is significantly different than it was 10 years ago. I've answered tons of questions with local governments, with reporters who say, recycling's dead, but the public doesn't care. And I can give them example after example of communities who are coming to us to expand, to grow. It's, that's a misinterpretation of the data. The data is reflective of, of a shift in packaging type. So we are actively having that conversation with as many companies, many producers as possible to say, can we can we look at what is the inbound 
flow of potentially recyclable materials. Can we assess how much of it? Is it 900 pounds per household? We're working on getting that. And then measure against, for right now, a snapshot me measurement of against how many pounds per household are we recovering? Uh, so if we're recovering 450 pounds of recyclables per household, can we snapshot the activity for now? Now we'd have to do that differently over time because that, that, will con that ton will continue to evolve and I think uh, there will be different ways to recover, but I, I think having a, a joint effort to assess Im impact and change of impact over time, that, that's an active conversation, not just we should, but, but actively who wants to do it this way now yeah. and uh, ongoing. And I, I think it's really important that when we're talking about these things, it's not just in this room, it's after we leave this room too, right? So I encourage you to be engaged with organizations like AmeriPen, like the Recycling Partnership, uh, with different forums where people are trying to figure out what the practical solutions are. The practical solutions that are based on the scientific information that David said is important, balanced with the fact that, as we heard earlier this morning, consumers just want to recycle to feel good about their consumption. They don't want to feel that they've overconsumed as long as they put it in the recycling bin, it's okay. I believe it's the responsibility of industry and government to work together to make sure that we have a solution that uses the science to provide the best benefit and still meets the consumer's needs for wanting to toss something into the recycling bin. And I think we can create the innovation that lets that happen. I think it takes a lot of work. I think it's difficult. I think it costs money. It's not free. Recycling is a manufacturing activity that is not free. We have to recognize that. But I think it's possible. You know, 30, 35 years ago, the American car makers said, we can't give you a quality car and a cheap car, right? And look what happened to them, right? The competitors came in and said, we'll give you a quality car and a cheap car at the same time. We'll do what the other guy says he can't do because it's too hard, it's too difficult, it's not the way we work, it's not the way the system operates. It's beyond our ability, right? That industry had to change, and it changed because of demands from the marketplace to do better. So I think if we think about how we can work together collectively um, to meet the needs of the marketplace, but in a way that's balanced with the science and providing a benefit that we know we need to provide, then we can be successful. And so hang on. Uh, what I want to do, is, so, so then what is this circular economy, right? I mean, we, we've got all these answers from folks who, who put in their, um, their cars. We asked you guys that question when you checked in. We got a lot of these questions. We got a lot of answers that, you know, the circular economy is zero waste, right? It's a system where everything is designed for sort of this perfection, this perfectly closed loop, and it's zero, zero waste. I think a lot of people um, who aren't as familiar with this term or aren't as familiar with this field might think it's just synonymous with recycling, right? So what is, the, what is circular economy? Is it the same as recycling? Is it this perfectly closed loop? Should it be this perfectly closed loop, right? What, what should we be striving for? And, you know, what's the, what's the goal here? I think first we need to recognize it's not one loop. There isn't a loop, right? It's a whole bunch of interconnected systems that have inputs and outputs. And inputs from one system become, come from outputs from another system if we're smart. And the way the circular economy can benefit us is if instead of taking something and putting it in the ground when we're done with it, if we put it back into one of the other loops as an input, then we have a benefit to society. So I think it's important that we think about it as an interconnected system. We have to think holistically, Big picture, what's the maximum benefit across the life cycle? Uh, all those things are important. I think to think of it as one system would be a big mistake. I think the most important thing we have to remember, though, is the circular economy has not, I'll say that again, has not created a perpetual motion machine. Okay? We do not have some magical system where if we just keep the material in the loop, we're suddenly unconstrained from resource limitations. No, it takes energy, it takes people, it takes equipment. It takes a lot of things to operate these industrial systems. And so we need to maximize our resource efficiency across all those systems. And it's when you put all the systems together that we need to do it, not independently one at a time, but across the total. Thank you for that great definition of what the circular economy could be. I want to offer a couple of warnings about what the circular economy shouldn't be. So the circular economy. government agency. Right, right, okay. So, so here we go. Warn, here's the warning. The circular economy should not be recycle or die. It should not be recycle everything. There are certain products that should not be recycled. PVC scrap from China with high levels of lead and brominated flame retardants should not be recycled into flooring that my toddler is going to crawl on, okay? It should go in the landfill. You know, old furniture with, you know, again, endocrine disrupting flame retardants in it should not be reused. It should be landfilled. And certain times in the, in the packaging world, 
right now, the best choice we have is to choose a material that has very low upstream impacts and then send it to the landfill. And that may make people feel icky, but it's not government's job to make people happy. Right. So, oh. okay. so, so, I mean, you, you talked about this, this, you know, this, this desire to help people satisfy their, their need to recycle. We also need to change the conversation. One of the things that, that worries me about circular economy is that it could be a bromide or a red herring that prevents us as society from addressing the fundamental unsustainability of our systems of production and consumption. And I want to share another example with this. My good friend Alex, if you're, if you're listening, can you please bring up the water slides? <laughs> um, we did a life cycle analysis of different methods of delivering drinking water a few years ago, and I want to just show a few of those results here. This first graph is showing five different types of environmental impacts. Global warming is not the only environmental impact, folks, okay? Materials impact the environment and our health in some other very profound ways. So energy use, carcinogenic pollutants, respiratory effects such as asthma, and ecotoxicity. These are five of the ten or so impacts we studied. The blue bars show the, the environmental and health impacts for a single-use PET water bottle recycled at a rate of 37%. The red bars show the environmental and health impacts if that bottle is recycled at a rate of 62%. Clearly, and this is impacts over the entire life cycle, this isn't just the plastics Piece. It's the transportation and the filling and the ozone and the UV and, you know, the whole thing, okay? So clearly, increasing recycling reduces environmental impacts, although not by much. What else could we do, though? Well, a lot of people in the bottled water industry figured this out when oil prices went high. You can make the bottles a lot thinner. So the next slide, in green, we have the environmental impacts of lightweighting the bottle. That's really important. By the way, that's product stewardship. That's the producer taking responsibility for reducing the environmental impact of their product. It has nothing to do with recycling, although recycling is still beneficial. We want people to recycle these bottles. There's something even better. We can show the next slide, please. In blue is drinking water out of the tap. Now, this is modeled as the very worst tap water scenario. What is it? It's a consumer who drinks water out of the tap in a refillable bottle and they wash that bottle every day. Now, I'm not the hygiene police. I'm not here to tell you how often you should wash your reusable bottles. But if you wash your reusable bottle every day in the brand of home dishwasher, which by the greatest margin ever failed to qualify for the EPA Energy Star program, this is the worst energy and water consuming dishwasher legally sold in the United States in the last 25 years, you get these results in aqua. And the final slide in orange, you can barely see in those tiny, tiny little lines there. That's drinking tap water in a reusable bottle and washing it once a week in, a refill, in, a, in an Energy Star dishwasher. So if the circular economy means drinking water out of PET bottles and recycling it, I'm not for that. I mean, we want to recycle those PET bottles, but we have to change the conversation and say, yeah, recycling is good, but it's not enough. We need to get upstream into sustainable product design, production, and ultimately consumption, because that's the root driver of all of this. Yeah, so I, so I work with a lot of companies, and I had, before I came into my position as the, this executive director, I was working uh, with companies and organizations like FPI on, as a consultant on how do you make the recycling system work for you? And, and very often, you know, you work with a company of, I have this thing, and I want MRFs to take it. What can I do to get a MRF to take this now? And you have to pull back and say, why would they want to? Right. And when you get to the point that you think, you know, how do I get the circular economy to work for me? You're missing the point of the circular economy is there to build a healthier trajectory for not just production of materials, not just production of consumables, but also for life. So how does recycling fit into it? It's not, they're not synonyms. They shouldn't be. We're one small part when it makes sense. I, you know, for being the executive director of an organization called the Recycling Partnership, there are plenty of times when we say that shouldn't be recycled. It, it's when it makes sense for the material and for the system. Now, when it does make sense, this is why I'm in this field. I started off, I wanted to be a turtle biologist. I am not a turtle biologist. But the, um, I got so enthralled by this seemingly, you know, lumpy sort of activity of recycling that actually had all this fury of bizarre connections behind it and it's economics and it's marketing and it's in its end markets and it's consumer behavior and then there's communities who have dancing mascots to promote it like how does this all work together and so this is the thing that is recycling and when it works well what are the outputs water savings 
greenhouse gas savings, energy savings, and positive, positive economic impacts. Yes, John, positive economic <laughs> impacts. So then it becomes really fascinating, but it is not easy. It is hard and it is sticky and it will remain that way. But if we pull in to a narrow bracket of how can we make this recycling system work better, then it, it is better for all of us for many things, but not for all things. Yeah. So. Jim, how do you define the circular economy? Uh, by using the word economy. And we need to always remember that economy is a key part of that conversation. And you know, it's interesting, Keith talked about how you create those market situations. I mean, when we first wanted, when we first declared this goal to have our cups recyclable, rather than going straight to municipal governments and saying, demanding that they ac accept cups into their system, what we did was we went straight to paper mills. And we started sending truckloads of Starbucks paper cups and Tim Hortons cups to paper mills all around the country and said, play with this stuff. Because what we saw was a perception at the time that, that our cups were not recyclable because of polyethylene coating, food contamination, the sleeves on the cups, the plastic lids, you name it. And, and so because of that, you saw that no one was accepting those cups into their system. Um, and I really believe in creating market pull. There's the economy side of the conversation rather than market push. And we're able to do is get a number, you know, a critical mass of paper mills around the country to say, sure, we can we can process this stuff. We can actually make money doing it at the same time, which send the signals down to the MRFs to say, all right, now you can put this stuff in your bales because you have a customer to sell it to. Um, but that's you know that's the messy part as you talked about, Keith, about these systems is how you create that economic pull and do it in a meaningful way. But we always need to focus on the economy part of it, the circular economy. And I just I know we're short on time, but I don't want to I don't want us to miss the conversation about innovation as well um, because. Despite all the conversations we heard today, um, I'm a true believer in innovation, and we don't know what the next solution is going to look like. And this is why I'm so confident in Gen Y is their ability to innovate and come up with really cool stuff that we've never even thought of. And I think there's a lot of opportunity here. While we continue to struggle with the existing, existing system and while we continue to stumble our way through the existing system, that innovation is really going to take course. But if you are an innovator out there and you are a product inventor out there and if you're watching on the Green Biz website, um, know that innovation is not just about inventing a thing. Innovation is really about thinking about the whole system and how you can fit into that system. Because I can't tell you how many people call me on a weekly basis and say, I've got the coolest solution for your ex. I'm going to make your coffee grounds into Java logs. You know, I'm going to turn your, your cups into this cool new building product. I'm going to do this and this and this. And my response back to every one of those innovators is, all right, come get it, and it's yours for free. And you know, the irony of that is, is not understanding the system of boring logistics to move stuff from one place to another, which in fact is the place for the greatest amount of innovation to come. It's not in the invention, it's in the logistics of moving this stuff around from 20,000 Starbucks stores around the world where they have little quantities into one place where they have big quantities. That's where the real innovation is going to happen. And I think that in combination with the, the true inventors of things out there, the inventors in this room of how we're going to innovate in that space of logistics and boring moving stuff around, is much more exciting to the, what you call us, geeks like us. So let's focus on that too. But wouldn't you say, I, we're working with companies who are having to figure out end of life after they have a successful part, sure. product on the market, and then consumers who say, I love this but. So that is a huge driver. And so I would, I, sometimes we hear innovation and recycling being counter to one another. I'd like to, but. But I would say that real innovation, and I'm married to a product designer, right. um, real innovation comes by thinking through that logistics, thinking through the end markets, and making sure that they are end-of-life scenarios and putting them together. And, and that takes a little bit more time, but it saves time in the end. Absolutely, yeah. So should it be that we should be thinking more on the R&D side about design for recycling, design for recovery, you know, what, what's the design innovation that needs to be happening sort of on the upstream side? For yeah, side the answer is yes, for sure, and, and smart companies are already doing that. Um, smart companies are already designing for innovation. Smart companies are already designing for cost reduction in their packaging, which, by the way, often reduces greenhouse gases. Smart companies are really focusing on how they create packaging that provides, first and foremost, the material safely arriving to where it's supposed to be and preserving that material, especially in the food service industry, doing it a safe way. Um, and smart companies are focusing on end of life as, as part of their design criteria. So it's just, it's just thinking about the system for sure. But, you know, I can also tell you that when we talk about design for environment or design for these other things, systems like extended producer responsibility and others where, you know, you're, as a producer, we're paying fees in Canada and Europe for the production of our package. Um, 
the impact that that has on design is a real misnomer. And, you know, I think that, that folks who are advocates of EPR, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm one way or another, and I'm, I don't really, I'm agnostic on the issue, but the advocates of EPR really believe that EPR drives packaging design, and I can tell you today it has no impact on packaging design, because the cost of EPR and the fees associated with that are completely outweighed by the need, as I said, to market the product, deliver a safe product that's going to keep your food intact, and, and get that product to you in a, in a very specific way, and sell that product. That's what product manufacturers focus on. That's what packaging designers focus on. EPR is down here somewhere when it comes to that list of considerations. So, you know, there are things that work in packaging design. There are things that don't work. That doesn't happen to be one of them. And again, that doesn't mean we should or shouldn't be passing EPR laws, but, you know, we just also need to understand the misconceptions about some of the regulations we, we advocate for and what the real impacts of those are. So let's talk a little bit more about design for recycling and recyclability. Okay. Okay, so in the last, what, what, what do we want to do as, as producers and consumers of good, sustainable stuff? We want stuff that has low environmental impacts, right? So how do we know if a design has a low environmental impact? Well, the best way to know it is through, is through environmental life cycle analysis, but that's difficult and expensive and confusing and whatnot. So what do we do instead? Well, for the last 40 years, what we've done in this country and elsewhere around the world is since we don't know the actual impacts, we've relied on these attributes. Attributes such as recyclability, compostability, degradability, local, bio-based, uh, yada, 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 right? And it's assumed that since recycling is generally better for the environment than landfilling, that ergo recyclable products must be better. Since, com since composting is better, compostable products must be better. But when you, when you peel back the, you know, and you look at the actual data, there's very little correlation between recyclability, compostability, and environmental goodness. I mean, Mercury is eminently recyclable, but we don't want it in our products, right? <laughs> so just because something is recyclable does not make it inherently ego-groovy. So if we're going to design for recyclability, what we really have to have along with that is an evaluation of the environmental benefits. Why do we want it to be recyclable? Because we want to recycle waste. Why do we want to recycle waste? To conserve resources and reduce pollution. So then the question is, does our new recyclable product or a compostable product conserve resources and reduce pollution. If it does, it's a good choice. And if it doesn't, you might as well be using a Ouija board to make decisions sure. because you're going to get just as reliable results. Mm -hmm. um, just hoping that if it, that since it's recyclable, it's good for the environment. Well, All right. Megan, but isn't gonna, this where we're confusing yeah. terms on circular, like yeah. we're trying to make circular economy and design for recyclability be the same thing. Circular economy is just about as much of what we don't do or choose not to do or reuse as what we recycle or put into a product. When I think of design for recyclability, and I've worked on it with organizations and companies, it's, it's the point of you're going to make this thing and you can make it in a way that gives it an end of life option or you could miss it just by one, one piece. So if you just don't do that one thing, you've got, you've got a much better. So when I think of design for recyclability, it's after we've moved down to the decision-making process of I want to make this thing, now how do I make it right for recycling? And, and only then. So, so here's my general rule of thumb. Because the environmental impacts upstream are so much bigger than the benefits of recycling. If you have this product and it's not recyclable for just one little tweak, if you can make that one little tweak like PET bottles and they've got the full, what's it called? Shrink sleeve. Full shrink sleeve, right? If you get, the full shrink sleeve inhibits the recycling process because the optical sorters can't identify it as PET. Unless it's the same material. Unless it's the same material. So if you could change it to the same material or if you could make it not quite full, just a small tweak that has a small upstream impact that might even be a benefit and it becomes recyclable, you don't need an LCA. Go for it. It's when you're talking about, well, gosh, this material isn't recyclable, so I'm going to switch from this material to that material. I'm going to make a major change in the upstream footprint of my product that I say all bets are off. The recyclable option may be the better option, but you can't safely predict it's a better option just because it's recyclable. When the three of us together, we talk really fast. Yeah, you do. <laughs> so you let do. me summarize all that by saying <laughs> that what we need to design for the whole system performance, right? Mm. This is about the whole system. It's about the life cycle. It's thinking holistically. We need to design for the whole system performance. That includes 
recycling. That includes the upstream impact. It includes protecting the product, right? I'm a packaging engineer, and I worry most about protecting the product because if the coffee doesn't make it to the consumer, I've wasted all the resources in growing the beans, yeah. harvesting the beans, roasting the beans, double roasting the beans, triple roasting the beans, whatever I'm going to do, transporting the package, all that's wasted, right? We have got to make sure that we protect the product as part of the system thinking. All right, and now I want to turn it over to you. So what are your questions? What do you want to know from this group? What did they say that was totally insane? What did they not say? We can, oh, we can count on Patty. I, I saw know. her hands. Um, and if you could tell I us um, heard, where you're like, from, that'd be great. Oh, pay yeah. more with more recycling. Uh, the, the plastics person. Um, my, my question is, um, I haven't heard you guys talk about infrastructure. It seems to me right now one of the big issues we have is, is the, uh, a lack of infrastructure and a lack of a systemic infrastructure. Um, Oregon's a good example of that with the plastics and the lack of uh, um, auto sort capacity because you have the wrong infrastructure. Um, but I think that's a very common thing uh, throughout the country is we call it a waste system or a ma waste management system. Syst there is no system to this. <laughs> so I, I just I would love to hear your thoughts about the infrastructure and how we can normalize things because then it can be more efficient and cost effective. Well, last year alone, we leveraged $11 million worth of new infrastructure on the ground through the recycling partnership. And primarily, that's in the form of recycling roll cards. Um, so, uh, which is, I'm sure, every waste management in person in the room just immediately said, contamination, contamination. <laughs> so, the, the role of um, new infrastructure in the ground means we've, we've got significant MRF infrastructure, we have reprocessing infrastructure, we have mill capacity. We have, we have capacity. What we need is a better way to get more, better material there. And everything that we're doing is working on, uh, from the in, the demand, in demand back, that marketplace pull idea, there is plenty of demand for the material. There is a MRF, there's plenty of MRF and processing capacity to do it. But the mechanisms of, of effectively and smoothly getting more better, higher quality material through that system so that we have as little yield loss along the way, less trash to throw away along the way, is really the process. Um, but in order to build that, that infrastructure from the local government level to get it going, it takes fiscal capital, but it also takes human capital. The human capital comes in in um, helping to ad address best management practices and helping to engage the public in participating the right way, but, but also working with the local governments to make sure their programs are as top-notch as possible so that the consumer has an easy way to do it. We always want to start with education, right? Whenever there's any sort of recycling thing, we can hold an event, we can teach the children, we can start with something fun, but we always, with our city partners, say, as we're helping them with their infrastructure to get more, better material through, stop. Let's look at your house. How, is your house in order? Are you up to best management practices? Are there things we need to change to get cleaner material through before you engage the public in engaging that infrastructure? So, Patty, I took your question and twisted it a little bit, but does anyone else have real infrastructure answers? You did well. Thanks. All right. I Jim think there's it. another one. Is there another one over here? Okay. Hi. Um, you actually almost answered my question. I was going to bring up contamination. I help with the communications with our employee base around the recycling program. And everyone's really, really confused about what can be recycled and we're having challenges with contamination in our recycling. So I'm wondering if you have communication tips, and I know every place is different and it depends on where it goes, mm -hmm. but like really like three basic rules for recycling that we can share so that you can get the best end product. And who are you and where are you from? Oh, sorry, my name is Shannon Bart. I'm the sustainability manager at NBC Universal. Yes. Uh, yeah, so when we designed this new module for the or mo model for the recycling partnership, we knew we needed to address access, that's uh, infrastructure to get more coming through, and it immediately quality, more better, reducing contamination. So you asked for tips. Um, I would say that we just launched last month this new module all around 
quality in the Cuyahoga region, which is Cle Cleveland region, uh, and we're now engaged in a statewide partnership to do that same thing all across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, so with that, then it will be open and wide to public, uh, public community producer, or adoption. So we spread it out to our newsletters, our workshops, um, and trying to get those pieces out. But here's the, the difficulty with contamination. It's not just how you communicate, it's how you operate, it's how you run your routes, it's how you engage your drivers in looking, it's how you reject bins sometimes, sometimes you say no. And, and there's a hesitancy to do that because one, communities offer recycling programs as a service and they don't want to tick off their citizens, right? You want to make them happy. Um, but then two, it's costly to slow down, to pull up, to look. And so what we have, uh, we're developing are some, some cost comparisons of, yes, it's expensive to do that, but what's the cost if you don't? This is a short-term cost versus long-term. So it's really doing those things before then you can address the communications. And then the next, then it's still, God, I'm feeling like Peter, I've got harder news. But it's, then it's, then we can't even talk about the yes-no list. We first have to make sure that the citizens are engaged with their community program, that they feel that it's worth their time, they feel like it's viable, that it's vibrant. And you have to get that behavior to engage before you can say, great, now do this, not that. And only then can you speak to a very large or small amount of the population about really the nuts and bolts of every other little minutia of recycling. You know, contamination is posing an existential threat here to the future of at least curbside recycling programs. I would rather see us recycle fewer materials well than try to recycle many materials poorly. So it, it does go back to program design and choosing what you put in your program in the first place. Mm -hmm. But that, that is completely misaligned with the message that we get from you know, from municipalities, from others who say it's all about zero waste and it's all about putting everything in these bins. And, and, and you know, I think that's the greatest challenge is, yep. is David, you're absolutely right. Um, and I think everyone in this room would agree that you're absolutely right. But when we get these challenges, you know, and these, this messaging of sure we can achieve zero waste, just put it all in the bin. And sure we can achieve zero waste, everything's going to be recyclable. Um, you create a mindset among your consumers that that forces that demand for, well, I want my community to be zero waste, and I gotta outcompete Seattle, or I gotta outcompete San Francisco so we can all be zero waste. Um, and you, you create this self fulfilling prophecy, and the infrastructure doesn't have the ability to keep up with that self fulfilling you, prophecy. This is one of the reasons why Oregon, as a state, has not embraced zero waste. You should all applaud and, Oregon. And why we're many, trying to change times. the conversation yeah. Yeah. to what really matters and what are the environmental outcomes we're trying right. to achieve. Well, yeah, what you're, we call those wish cyclers. I'm yeah. going to put it in because I think, yeah. Yeah. well, wish cyclers wish is cyclers. cute. Yeah. yeah, we also have retro cyclers. I do this because that's the way it used to be. And so it's really, there's your education uh, point of getting to the, no, the new norm, and it's always going to be a new norm. Like once you, once you establish it, you may have to do it again in a couple years, and that's hard work. I, 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 I have one wish list very quickly, yeah. um, and I don't know how to solve this. And if the lawyers in the room think I'm talking about collusion, then maybe I am. But um, harmonization is, is a huge challenge. And especially for a company like ours, that, like I said, operates 20,000 stores around the world in very different communities. When someone says, hey, Jim, is your cup recyclable? I say, where do you live? Because mm -hmm. that's the answer to that question. That, um, that work of the common suite. Right. Yeah, so right. What's a, what should be on the yes list? And then, and then this is how we think to work towards that, is not city by city, but what if we work in MRF sheds? So just like there's water sheds, there are sheds of towns that all serve the same MRF. That's what we did in Cuyahoga. Four MRFs, 51 communities, how do you make them all collect the same thing so that you can get consistency between home, work, and play? Because the other it's main thing that's all. driving contamination is confusion. I don't know. I don't know. And if you don't know, you're either not going to engage or you're going to just give it a go. Right. The yeah. And, and the challenge with consistency is how do we get consistency where we collect and recycle more things right. instead of just saying one thing, right? We could just say we'll only accept newspapers, right? And right. we could all be very consistent. Um, but we can't let ourselves get into that mindset that we're going to simplify the system so far that we give up on all these other things. That's right. And we have other questions over here, so we I want to make sure folks... Oh, my total blind spot. 
Oh, oh Ron's microphone again. John, you had an hour. Come on. No, um, I simply wanted to say that it was a great discussion, and, and I really enjoyed it. It was some very smart stuff. And I had two very quick questions. One, Dave, could you please have a conversation with Mayor de Blasio in New York? <laughs> As a New Yorker, we, I, I, I'd love to see you do that. And I wonder what the whole panel thinks about some of the moves to get rid of plastic bags to ban certain products. What do you think about that? First off, I think we should all pay Dave to go on the road and talk to many mayors around the country <laughs> and um, make our lives easier. Um, but I'm not going to answer the plastic bags question. Somebody else can do that. I'm not in favor of the government telling me what product I can have and not have, whether it's plastic bags or, or takeout containers. Um, from a fast food restaurant or anything else. I think they should stay in the business of protecting uh, public health and safety. Sure. And we at the Recycling Partnership have a very narrow view of we're trying to make the system work for the things that it should work. And I, you know, so that's outside the purview. And we're in the middle of legislative session, and so I'm afraid I can't answer your question about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I thought when we had one more over here. Hi, Brenda Foley with Keep America Beautiful. Love the conversation, you guys. Thank you. And hopefully this will get us on uh, something you can talk about. But specifically, David, um, the challenges you face to address and to relook at things from what are the environmental outcomes? And how can you go to different mayors? Or how do we start spreading the word more so that we do shift that thinking and looking at that? Yes. And you have 11 seconds to answer. Uh, right. So what we did in Oregon was really difficult and took five years and it took a lot of stakeholder engagement and it's going to take a lot more time to change people's mindsets. Thank you. We're out of time. So, There's a timer right here, by yeah. the way. So I, I would say that in working our model for more better recycling, we have four levers we pull. One is technical assistance. So that's human capital of staff members going in to help communities adopt best management practices. The other ones are communication. So the eye candy and the tools and the things you need to build momentum. The third is grants, and we use those grants to leverage change that wouldn't otherwise happen. A dollar of ours, seven of yours will make change. And then the last piece we call champion building, and that's working with policymakers who don't get our industry. They think it's either going away or their third grader does it and it makes them feel good, and helping them make that economic connection that this is about building materials for manufacturing changes the whole thing up. So that's an ongoing thing that we can all do together. Brenda, you and I should do this together. This is an us thing, making that case. And it's not just about recycling. What? And it's not just about recycling. No, right? Okay. right. No. The whole system. Um, well, we're out of time, but I know that these guys are going to be here. If you have any